to welcome you to our time of worship today, especially those of you who are visitors and guests, and of course, those of you online joining us for worship today. Welcome, everyone. I do have a couple of announcements and changes for our Christmas activities this year. So, first, this year, instead of offering the poinsettias in memory of or in honor of a loved one, we are offering handmade Christmas ornaments created by our church member, Thelma Dikfus. These ornaments will be sold and placed on our angel tree once the angels are removed. After the Christmas Eve service, families may take ornaments home or give to the loved one. They are a $5 donation each, and funds collected will be designated to our Moving Forward Fund. We do plan to include a list of all ornament purchases in honor of and memory of your loved one in the bulletin on December 18th. The deadline to purchase ornaments is coming quickly, Wednesday, December 7th, to allow time for the list preparation. Second, this year, instead of just a Christmas cantata, we're having a Christmas festival 
on Saturday, December 10th from 2 to 3 p.m. in the sanctuary, followed by a Christmas cookie reception in Cooper Hall. Our handbells are playing, and the Grace Choir is joining with our chancel choir. So mark your calendars and invite your friends. Saturday, December 10th from 2 to 3 p.m. here in the sanctuary for a Christmas festival. Well, today we are going to finish our series of fruitful living in which we've been learning about the kind of life that is possible when we stay close to Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. Jeannie Naram will be presenting today's character trait, the ninth fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. On that note, let's stand, look around, give a hearty wave, good morning to someone, and then we will sing our praises to the Lord. Star. I will bless your name.
Please join me today as we affirm our faith with the Nicene Creed found on page 880 in the hymnal or on the wall behind me. We believe in one God, the Father, the almighty maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God light from light, true God from true God, the begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he became truly human. For our sake, he was shipped on Pontius Pilate, was suffered to death and has buried on the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We worship and adore you, God, for you are the mighty one, and yet you are gracious and loving towards us, full of gentle kindness. Father, we confess to you, O God, and before one another that we have sinned. Sometimes we are arrogant and proud. Sometimes we try to bring others to our side more to confirm that we are right than because we believe the way of Jesus is right. Where Jesus loved and invited, we have tried to conquer and defeat others. Instead of drawing others to Christ, we have pushed them away because we do not act like Christ. 
forgive us and empower us with your Holy Spirit to live fully into the likeness of Christ so that we may bear his name in truth. We give you thanks for all the ways you have gently called us to you. You have drawn us with love and you have pursued to us your way of life, eternal and abundant. You have always acted for our good and the good of all your creation. We pray for one another in our need and especially for our need to be open to your gentle calling. The forces of evil speak so loudly and powerfully that many are trapped in their lies. We know how persuasive these voices can be at times. As you continue to call your children home, empower us with your loving spirit that we may also be part of your call and not part of the shouting of evil. All these we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite our children through fifth grade over to Children's Church, as well as our sixth through twelfth graders to our new youth Sunday school class, which is held in the chapel classroom. The leaders of both of these fabulous programs will be in front of the sanctuary to lead the children and our students to the classes across in Cooper Hall. Parents, you can pick up your children from the classroom activities across from the nursery immediately following worship. I also invite our ushers to come forward at this time to prepare to receive our tithes and offerings, which we give to the Lord as an act of worship. I'd like to remind you that you can give online as well. It's very easy. Just go to our homepage and click the offering. It's in the middle of the screen. And then follow the instructions. You can set up a one-time gift or a reoccurring gift. If you need any help, call the church office. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give with joy into your kingdom today. May you bless our offering. Come, O oh Lord, and work through these gifts and extend your love through us, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of God. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promise so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, <coughs> forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Four beautiful children sat around a circle table two boys, two girls, and they were dressed in bright, colorful clothes. They sat on small wooden chairs to accommodate their five-year-old bodies. There was excitement in the air because they had been told by their parents that if they behaved, they would get a reward. They behaved. It was 1970. One marshmallow was placed on each plate in front of each child to enjoy. It smelled of heavenly sugar, and it was round and soft. And the children were told that if they could refrain from eating that marshmallow for 10 minutes, then they would get another marshmallow, and they could enjoy two. Only one child of the four waited patiently for the second marshmallow. The other three gobbled up it greedily, and they were within 30 seconds of taking that first marshmallow. It was called the marshmallow test, and it was in the United States in the 1970s. We might struggle to show self-control when offered something we desire, like the marshmallow, even if we know that it would benefit us more in the future to wait. Yet Peter urged us to add to our faith many important virtues, 
including self-control. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness in 2 Peter chapter 1 as Amanda has read this morning for us today. We're learning about the final fruit of the Spirit today, but we're on the edge of Advent. Soon, all of us are going to be scurrying around doing all things Christmas. But before that, I want to stop and pause. A friend of mine told me, in the hectic times of our lives, put a cup of hot chocolate in front of us. And I told her, I don't like hot chocolate. <laughs> she said, just pretend. So I want you to hold your cup of hot chocolate in front of you. Breathe in. Smell the hot. Feel the hot. Smell the sugary goodness of hot chocolate. Now breathe out and say after me, love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We don't create good fruit. It comes as a byproduct of blooming, thriving, and nurturing health. It comes when we have well fertilized. We have nurtured it, protected it from all those predators and from the harshness of the elements. Fruit of, of the Spirit are not fruit of our labors, but of Christ's labor in us. Good fruit comes from the abundance of God's grace through Holy Spirit. In speaking about patience, Amanda told us that the outer layer of the fruit serves as a protection so that the fruit doesn't become rotten. Now we can add self-control to that protection. An old legend tells of people who came wanting to buy fruit of the Spirit. They were told, we don't sell the fruit, we sell the seeds. Indeed, these traits of the holy life are not forced, not strive for, certainly not bought. Rather, they grow out of the believer's heart. They grow out of the indwelling presence of Jesus, the promised Holy Spirit. It's fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit, for a reason. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, right before our key Galatians scripture, Paul gives us a list of the works, plural, of the flesh. And flesh refers to all sin sinful nature of humans. And I think it's safe to say that we've exhibited at one time one or more of those traits. These sinful works of the flesh can be produced by any person. In contrast, these nine fruit traits of the fruit of the Spirit can be produced only by the Holy Spirit. So the works of the flesh, plural, by anyone, the fruit, singular, by only one person in the Holy Spirit. Self-control is last. Now, why is that? It's not because it's the least important but because it takes self-control to bring all other fruit of the Spirit to our lives. It's not because it's the least, but because it takes self-control to bring all other fruit of the Spirit to our lives. This last fruit is no mere caboose that can be taken off the train with no ill effects. The final fruit is vital to keeping the whole train on the tracks. It keeps all other fruit fresh. We cannot rightly give ourselves in love until we have learned to control ourselves. Our self has to be mastered before it can be used in service to others. The fruit begin with self-giving love and end in self-control. 
Choosing to live by the Spirit brings peace and other benefits, while living life disconnected from the Spirit brings chaos and hate. Paul writes to the Galatians, because they want to comply with the law given to them through their history. They want to be good Christians. So he writes to encourage them to let the Spirit guide their life. He knows from his own experience that obedience to the law can disconnect from the Spirit. When the Spirit lives in us, living by the law may disconnect from our soul. The Greek word for self-control is enkratia, meaning in strength or in power. In Aramaic, it can be used as the word endurance, and the King James Version translates it as temperance, self-mastery. It means to come within yourself and come out of yourself, but not by yourself. It can only be accomplished by the power of the Lord. Second Timothy tells us, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline, self-control. Now, self-control is three things. Number one, it's about striding, not striving. It's about striding the walk we are on with Christ, not the striving, not the trying harder, as Pastor Steve has reminded us us these last weeks. We sometimes mistakenly think if we try harder, our lives would be filled with more love, joy, peace, kindness, more fruit of the Spirit. But it's not possible to simply try harder. As we do things necessary to stay close to Christ, the Holy Spirit naturally produces these within us. The fruit of the Spirit are byproducts of Jesus-centered, Spirit-filled loving. It's the striving along the walk, not the trying harder. And one of the best exercises is walking. Walk away from arguments that lead to anger. Walk away from thoughts that steal your happiness in Christ. The more you walk away from things that destroy your soul, the happier you'll be in Christ. The famous basketball player and coach John Wooden won this unprecedented 10 NCAA championships when he coached the UCLA Bruins. And when he asked how he kept his cool, he responded, I have the same explosive emotions as everybody else. When UCLA is behind or a ref has made a call against us, I reach in my pocket and I reach for the silver cross that I have there. It's not a good luck charm. I felt it and remember what is most important when I feel myself out of self-control. One of the things that made Abraham Lincoln so great was his marvelous self-control. Our nation was coming apart at the seams with the Civil War, and it had everybody's emotions at extremes. And to add to that tension, some army contractors were ripping off the government. And this made Lincoln very angry. William Seward was his secretary of state, and he wrote this scathing letter to a thieving contractor and showed it to Lincoln. Not half strong enough, said Lincoln. Seward was delighted, so he wrote another letter that just scorched the paper. There, said the president, that serves him right. Very well, Mr. President, I'll mail it at once, said Seward. Oh, no, said Lincoln, don't mail it. Throw it in the wastebasket. Lincoln controlled his desire to blast those taking advantage of the situation for personal gain. If he would have sent all those nasty letters he wrote, he probably would have lost the war. His self-control is in great measure the cause of why we are a free nation. It's not enough that Lincoln was a good man, that he had goodness in his heart, for if he had not been a self-controlled man, all his goodness would have been in vain. 
He was striding, walking in his self-control with the Lord. Number two, self-control is about training. We've talked about this before. Training is about spiritual exercises like studying scriptures, memorizing verses, participating in Bible study, personal meditation, fasting, which I find hard to do, and training ourselves in financial responsibility by using the monetary gifts that God has given us wisely. When my mother was ready for dialysis, um, she was 90 years old. And she and my stepfather uh, told the doctor there would be no dialysis in her life. Um, they had asked her to do that because she was in kidney failure. So she was placed on hospice. But they did ask for a new diet plan, one that would help keep her kidneys to remain functioning. And this re uh, diet list required her to give up a lot of the foods that she loved. There was orange juice and potatoes, and there were bananas. Uh, there was pineapple. She loved those white potatoes, she told me, with butter and sour cream. That was her favorite food. But they were all high in potassium. Now, a lot of people in her position along the way at that time in their life do decide to um, continue to eat the same foods they've always enjoyed. And they wanted to enjoy them. They wanted to live their life as they were able to, and it shortened their life. But she chose self-control, and she lengthened her life. She trained herself in self-control. And eventually, God gave her the grace to not crave all of those things that she had enjoyed. Number three, self-control is not about me. It's about we. Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 1 that God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. In community, fruit of the Spirit can grow, guiding and shaping the community. For the community will organically produce fruit formed by the Spirit. And this is where Miriam's thoughts in our first Fruit of the Spirit Sermon on Love comes in. She talked about those with whom you hang. They are connected us through us in love and self-control. For those you have closest to you will guide you, and you will guide them in self-control through the Spirit. There was an aerospace engineer named Destin Sandler, and he set out to learn how to ride a bicycle that some of his welder friends had made. And what's different about this bicycle is that when you turn the handlebars, the wheel turns in the opposite direction than normal. For example, if you turn the handlebars to the left, that front wheel moves to the right. Sandlin saw this as a challenge that he could easily overcome, but it took him eight months of practice in his driveway to become proficient and to master this strange bicycle. It included a number of spills. But his young son was able to learn to ride the backwards bicycle within two weeks, a reflection of how our minds work when we're older uh, versus when we are younger. Now, Sandlin took the backwards bicycle around the world, and he invited all kinds of people to try riding it. And nobody could do it without extensive practice. The video of the backwards bicycle is sometimes shown to church leaders because it illustrates how hard the change process and of making old habits turn to new habits by self-control can feel for people in community, in a church. Shifting those habits can feel very strange, like riding that bicycle backwards. It takes time for people to learn new ways, for them to struggle and have failures 
and it's a normal part of the process. In some ways, it's what needed is uh, a rewiring of our brains and habits, a deep unlearning as well as learning new things. You have to change behavior if you want to your church to change. Social media has stripped our ability to interact with others face to face. News media shows the violence, road rage, gun violence in our lives every day. If we don't have self-control over our actions, we will be destroyed. Now, anger is not a sin, but how we express anger can be. God gets angry. Jesus gets angry, right? We've seen this. Anger, like any other emotion, is a choice for each one of us. Proverbs 29, 11 says, Fools give vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. We need to realize that there is a cost to unconditional anger. An angry person stirs up conflict, and a hot-tempered person commits many sins, tells us in Proverbs. We need to learn to restrain our mouths. We've talked about this a lot, especially me. James in chapter 1 reminds us everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We need to reflect before reacting. Before you speak, think of the word think. So put that in your head, see it out there, think. And this is the handiest clue. T is for truthful. Is what you're going to say truthful? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspirational? Will it build up or tear down? N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? Ask yourself, why am I angry? What do I really want? And how can I get it? And lastly, how can we show our anger appropriately? Paul tells the followers in the city of Ephesus, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And we hear a lot of that in marriage counseling. Have you ever tried to do that? It's hard. Anger is a contagious disease. If you frown at someone, they'll frown back. If you smile, you're on your way to getting a smile back. We need to ask God's help in our anger. Psalm 141 tells us God and asks God to set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door to my lips. Matthew warns us, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. It's not what comes out. It's what's in your heart. Self-control is a heart issue from our relationship with God. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to show peace. And be thankful, Paul reminds us in Colossians 3. Now, Proverbs explains the difference of not having self-control versus the value of having it. Chapter 25 says to us, Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. In chapter 16, we learn it's better to be patient than powerful. It's better to win control over yourself than over whole cities. We sometimes mix self-control with patience. However, they are very different. Self-control allows you to keep your mind focused on God while avoiding the temptations of your desires. Many worldly temptations can be strong, but our spiritual self-control can be stronger when we have our eyes on God. Self-control can mean either abstinence or moderation. I think that's very important. Self-control can mean moderation, just the same as abstinence. 
So when we're tempted to overeat, overdrink, overspend, overindulge, or overspeak unwisely, everything good can be bad if it goes to excess. Sexual misconduct is not the problem, not the only problem. Paul mentions sexual offenses only in passing when he talks about this conventional list of works in the flesh. Instead, he focuses on envy. Have you ever been envy? Backbiting, competitiveness, all of these flesh works, vices that Paul mentions, puts us in living at odds with God. Self-control for us is a ceaseless battle. It never ends, and we are not always the victors. Perhaps we can't defeat the problem entirely, but we can fight to control it as the spirit is within us. The one thing is certain. If I would not have started, I wouldn't have this trouble stopping, said John Timmerman in his book, The Way of Christian Living, when he was talking about the pathetic battle that he waged with smoking. That last sentence is the key. If he had not lost self-control in the beginning, he would not be so fighting so hard to regain control of his life and habits. The purpose of self-control is prevention. If we prevent the enemy from getting a foothold in our life, we're free and we control our actions. It's, either, easy, it's easier to keep a, a bad habit from starting than to stop it once it gains control of your life. It's the job of self-control to keep enemies out of your life. Let this fruit get weak, and you're a fair game for the enemy of your soul. The key to freedom in Christ is the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Clearly this last, but not the least of the fruit, is vital to our success as followers of Christ. Let us be willing soil, as the song speaks, in which the Holy Spirit can grow all of these nine precious fruits. Mark tells us, ask and it shall be given unto you. And Matthew says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Now come back next Sunday when we'll celebrate the beginning of Advent and the holy season of Christ's birth. Invite a friend or a neighbor or someone you have just met who might not have a church family to join you for worship next week. May we renew our understanding of the blessing that a self-control is, being strong and determined in controlling our speech and disciplining ourselves to praise you, God, and encourage others. May we feel God filling our hearts with his love, peace, and joy, taking away all those thoughts of bad anger. And may we walk in God's loving and gracious spirit every moment of every day. Please receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace that only comes from the Spirit. Amen. Please stand.